Welcome to the Population Genetics Lecture Series. In this lecture series, we're going to be talking about the mechanisms that drive evolution with focus on microevolution, which are the changes that occur in the gene pool of a population or how the actual genetic composition of the members of the same species changes over time and actually the mechanisms that drive that. So if you're watching this, I hope you've seen already the Evolutionary Theory a lecture series where we talked about how many, many thinkers and researchers influenced Darwin to create this theory of evolution that explains so much in biology. All of biology can be explained because of evolution, how form fits function, all of the things that happen, all the animal behaviors, everything has to do with evolution, with increasing an animal's chances of survival. Or if they decrease the animal's chances of survival, it will probably, the animal probably wouldn't be around anymore. It's the idea of fitness, which we'll actually review in this lecture series. We'll do a lot of review of that of those concepts that we talked about before. But we're also going to go into a little more detail, and I hope you follow along. Now, remember that when Darwin came up with his research, he didn't know a lot about the things we know now. He didn't know about genetics. He didn't know about how actually uh, the things, things are passed on from generation to generation. That wouldn't happen until Mendel came up with his research, and then much later he was actually going to be discovered because before he died, his work was not actually uh, presented to the, a large the scientific community. And uh, furthermore, uh, he didn't know anything about molecular genetics, which is the process that actually leads to the mutations, which cause the variations that he actually saw among the populations, which then led him to think about the evolutionary process. So let's talk about the new view of evolution based on all this new research and in, with focus on microevolution. But let's first talk about the basics that you need to know or everything we've talked about so far that actually makes this possible or to discuss this topic. So, first of all, the idea of inheritance. Remember that before Mendel, people used to think that genes were passed on from generation to generation uh, through particles, perhaps, or maybe some other way. But the one thing that people thought is that the traits of one parent and the traits of the other parent would mix with each other, or they would combine to form new traits in the offspring. Now, Mendel quickly realized that that's not, not the way that things happen. And that was more like there was some sort of particle, which we call factors, and we now call genes, the smallest particle of inheritance, or the smallest piece of DNA that actually codes for proteins, if you want to put it in molecular biology terms. But in terms of genetics, these genes were the things that were actually transferring the information, or the genetic information from one parent to an offspring. And that each parent gave half of its genetic information to the offspring, and the combination of both halves created a new whole. But not by blending the looks, but by actually each combination for each specific trait will actually lead to a specific type of dominance relationship will then determine the trait. In other words, for each trait, a gene from the mother and a gene from the father will combine to form a specific pattern where one will talk over the other or will both talk at the same time or if they're both the same they'll both say the same thing but regardless of what it is it forms what we call a genotype where different versions of genes which we call alleles combine to form the actual phenotype which is the thing you actually see or the look now later other researchers will focus on the fact that these genes are actually inherited through chromosomes and they will research the things that happen during meiosis such as crossing over independent assortment and actually to actually understand how recombination of these genes leads to variation within the population over time but Mendel would actually notice the patterns of inheritance and figure out exactly how the genes are transferred from generation to generation and then other scientists would expand on that and talk about chromosomal inheritance and things like linkage and crossing over breaking down linkage. But that's genetics and that's going to be very influential in what we're going to be talking about so make sure you have those concepts fresh in your mind. You're also going to need to know the concepts of ecology with reference to species. Uh, what is a species? A species of course is one type of organism but how do you define one? How do you tell that one, so two organisms are not the same species? Well there's a lot of ways of doing that. Scientists can look at the way the uh, organism looks like or do a, what is called a morphological species test where they actually try to determine the way the species is by the way it looks. So they look too different from each other, they're probably not the same species. They all can also look at the role or the habitat that the animal occupies in the environment, which is called the niche test. They can also do molecular analysis where they actually code the protein sequence or the RNA or DNA sequence for the two organisms of interest to try to see if there's enough difference or similarity between them to call them or not the same species. 
and it's been used a lot throughout history, so I'll talk about that one as well, even though molecular genetics is the way to go nowadays. There's also the ecological species test, which is the idea of if you are the same species as another organism, then you are able, probably, if you're different genders, uh, to actually cross with each other and make offspring that can do, then go on to do the same. In other words, you can have fertile offspring with someone else, that means you are the same species. That ecological species test has been used a long, well, for a long time, and of course there's limits because you can't use it with anything that reproduces only asexually, but either way, these are the ways that you can determine what a species is. Regardless of what it is, each species will have what is called a gene pool, or the total genome, or genes which are present in this population, or, member, or group of members of this species. Now, a population then will, will have the capability of interbreeding, or members of the population will be able to have sex with each other and create new offspring with recombin recombined looks. So sexual reproduction will shuffle around the genes and create variation within the population. But it will not create necessarily new looks. It will just rearrange the looks that were already in the population. And that's not really evolution. It's just changing what was already there. Uh, but evolution is creating something new, better adapted perhaps to the environment that is around uh, the population. So how you get these new looks? Now, that's some of the things we actually have to talk in this lecture series. But some of these concepts we understood when we did molecular biology. And we talked about the idea of mutations, which are changes in the DNA sequence or that genotype, which therefore sometimes get translated to changes into the phenotype. Now, that will not always happen because sometimes the genes uh, which are mutated are non-coding genes or part of sequences which are no longer functional or that have structural purposes only, or sometimes they happen on introns which are not actually part of the pieces that get expressed, or sometimes they change the code without actually changing the amino acid in the sequence because of the tRNA wobble that we discussed in molecular biology in the protein synthesis lecture series. And there's other reasons why this could also be a silent mutation. And sometimes mutations will be disadvantageous, and those will usually not show up in the population because they will cause the organisms to die, and if the organism even survives with that, chances are they will not survive too long, or ultimately the, the trait will be deleted from the population because of natural selection. Same thing is true about neutral mutations, which may be carried on accidentally along with other mutations, but they are not going to be taking hold of the population too fast if they're not going to be causing an advantage to, to the organism. But sometimes, mutations can cause changes which accidentally cause what we call adaptations. These are variations or changes which actually change the look in a positive way and give the animal a better chance of surviving or enhance the animal's fitness. This could be either behavioral or physical. Now remember, the concept of fitness is the total amount of adaptations that an animal has which allows it to survive longer, have more children, which then survive to do the same. And an example of this is the moss, for example, which is adapted with its color for its environment. And if the environment changes, it might change what's adaptable. But within the context of a certain environment, natural selection will select against animals which or organisms which have traits uh, which make them less likely to survive and select four animals that make them more likely to survive. Remember the whole concept of his theory of evolution, of Darwin's theory of evolution, is that more animals will always be born as, that the environment can possibly sustain. That as populations grow exponentially, they eventually hit what is called the carrying capacity. And that leads to struggle for existence as animals struggle for the resources that they need to survive. And as they struggle, and they're different, there's variation between them, ultimately then, therefore, the ones which have the higher number of set adaptations will survive longer to have more children that survive to do the same. And since this has everything to do with the environment, if the environment changes, all of these things will change as well. And that leads to an ever-changing population over time through the process that he called natural selection. Now, if there's enough separation between two groups exposed to diff two different kinds of pressure or two different environments, either across space or across time, you're going to lead to changes in the species to form new species from previous existing species, which gives the concept of common ancestry, that all species come from previous existing species. But this is the idea of speciation or the formation of new species. And we're actually going to focus on this aspect of evolution, which is macroevolution, on the next lecture series. On this lecture series, we're going to talk about microevolution, which is the changes that occur within a population uh, without necessarily changing the species. It's just changing the composition of the species. 
And that's what we're going to start talking about in the next lecture series as we introduce the idea of population genetics. All right? I'll see you guys then. And remember these things, you're going to need them for the lecture series. So if there's any of these concepts that you do not understand, go back to the previous lecture series and study them. I hope you guys have fun and understand population genetics. See you later.